a tree table. We're, we're in um, Costa Maya, and Sean looks hot. Raincoat. Yeah. <laughs> Rocking the poncho. Rocking the poncho. We are on the. Whoa! Careful! Don't We're on a fancy See, bus. We're on the it's fancy bus. Board. We're on the deluxe it has bus. Like, we have tray tables. It has a tray table. <laughs> yes. Don't fall yet. You didn't sign the waiver. <laughs> right. <laughs> Everybody at Slippery. Yeah. You have another waiver to sign. So hurry up. Can't fall off your Yeah. Yeah. Take this out. But you know what? It's it's here. Yes, it is. And we have each other. Huh? It's a $50. I'll be wet. You can have it. Thank you. You can tell yours for $50? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what I said. I'll run around wet for $50. We let you right to it. <laughs> Second to no one. Second to no as medical doctors, dentists, mathematicians, engineers, architects, astronomists, astrologists, etc. Whatever ends with this, they were number one. <laughs> and believe me that they were obsessed with the curve. They tried to measure time the most accurately way possible. And as a fact, they designed several calendars which are more accurate than any other measuring system up till today. For example, we have a calendar, which is called the Gregorian, that came from the Roman calendar based in 10 months. That's why the names don't match. September means seven, but it's the nine. October means eight, but it's the 10th month. November means nine in Latin, but it's the 11th. And December means 10, but it's the 12th. How did that happen? Because there were two Roman emperors, Julius Caesar and Caesar Augusto, who decided to adapt their names to the calendar. That's the way we became to have 12 months instead of 10. And this calendar was perfected by Catholic Pope Gregorius XII, leaving it the way it is today. But unfortunately, we have a range of mistake of six hours every year. So every four years, we live one day behind. That's why we have to add up an extra day to February, make a leap here to catch up with time. By the way, this year, it's a leap here. And it's not coincidence that it's a leap here because we're going to have the first Maya leap here. What does that mean? That Mayas had calendars too, but they are not per perfect. However, the Maya calendar it's highly, highly accurate. It's over 1,300 times more accurate than our calendar today. The range of mistake in the Maya calendar is 17.28 seconds every year. So in one year, 17.28 seconds of range of mistake. Nothing. So we could say it's nearly perfect. It's the most accurate system to measure time up to date. The question might be, why the heck we don't take that calendar then? Well, the answer is simple. When the Europeans, the Spanish, came here on 1521, they reported that they saw a bunch of savages living out there in the jungle. So, it would be too insulting for the pride to admit that these savages had a better calendar of the one they had with their civilization. So that's the main reason. And besides that, it's money to business. That's why we don't go with that calendar. But Mayas know that calendar perfectly. Many of them, not all of them. And we know how it works. Well, Mayas appeared on the surface of the Earth on 3113 BC. They designed a long count calendar which takes 5,125 years. If we deduct minus 3113 to 5125, what number do we have left? 2012. We have heard a lot of stories about the end of the world on 2012. What's the calendar? This is the calendar, the Maya calendar. 
it's made, this one it's made in silver. Pure silver, sterling silver. Mayas had no alphabet. So, they had no A, B, C, D like we do. So they represented everything with drawings or symbols called glyphs. So that's we, why we say they had a hieroglyph writing system. And, as I'm sure you can see here, this one back there, I brought it enlarged in kind of a chart over here. Here it is. Until recently, we learned how to take the oil out of it. If you slice this, you will have it in this way. Yes. Of course, if you're thirsty, you can open one of those and drink the water. But uh, of course, you would need about 20 to make a glass of water. It's too much work for a glass of water. So, we knew how to make the oil from it, and recently, we were able to get it. But, we needed 300 of these to make this oil. Wow. And it's highly concentrated. It smells really good as a coconut oil. Okay, amigos, welcome to the Great Base. As you can see at the sides, we have some parts of the structure that weren't, ex weren't excavated. Those more or less, that's the way, again, it looks when the archaeologists get here. And you can see how we have the big trees on top of the structures. And obviously, just imagine what happens when we remove the roots of these trees. Wow. The structures will be partially damaged. So when that happens, the archaeologists take a lot of pictures and sometimes they even number the pieces <coughs> so they can put them back together after they remove the roots. Mm -hmm. But they like have the to leave a mark. There. If we look, at, look carefully over here, we can see this line like a serpent. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And also we can see it over here again, over here. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the <coughs> restoration line. That means that everything laying below it's original, but this has been restored. So probably there were some roots on here that they had to restore it. But the difference between rebuilding and restoring, it's very important. When you find a structure which had a temple and that had collapsed, you cannot rebuild it. It's got to uh, stay that way. But when you damage a structure during the excavations, then you're able to restore it. And you have to do it the same way. How did they hold their pieces together? Mostly it was with the natural weight of the stones. But also they used lime. They had no concrete, but they had calcrete. As, as a fact, all their, all their platforms had a layer of calcrete lime with some mud. So it was pretty good, like cement so that we didn't grow over there. And how did they get the lime? No hard ones in those days. Well, all the Yucatan Peninsula, it's a big limestone formation. So all they needed to do is to get the limestones and to cut fresh cut logs and put it together, bury it and burn it. Two days later, when they release it, when they develop all the dirt, the logs and the, and the limestone will be together in line. If they wet a little, they use it for sticking it, putting it together. And if they wet it more, they used it as paint for their fences. When the Spanish got here, they were highly surprised how the streets were well drawn and well aligned and well nicely painted with white line. And also, I told you in the bus that when the new ruler takes over, he would be willing to have new structures. So what he did basically, it's built up another layer of construction on top of the already existing one. Sometimes they knock down part of it to reduce the material, but the very most of times they just built up another layer. So you might be wondering, 
How long did it take him to do this? This was not done by one ruler. The first one was made small structure. When the next ruler came, they put another layer on top of the same structure, made it look bigger, and then bigger, and bigger, and bigger, and bigger. For example, if we pay attention over here, we can see that we have this broad staircase, and we have baby staircases at the side. If we remove this staircase, we will have a second layer showing up. And if we move the second layer, we will have the third layer showing up. And something curious, that these it's narrow steps, but these are wide. How come? Because first, this period in a time was used as a ceremonial center, and these were temples. We can see this is symmetric to this, to this, to this, because there, these were the twin temples, one temple up there and another temple up there. But then there was another ruler who said, I don't want to use these as temples anymore, so I'm going to fulfill everything to that level, make it a base, and I'm going to make the temple at the top. So that's what he did. That's why we have these wider, because these are not ceremonial anymore. But the one which is underneath, it was ceremonial in a time. So he built up a structure up there, which is really high, really big. And that was mm. to sanitize it with this. And also, if it's very hot. Oh, it smells so good. With sugar and water and ice. Delicious. Mm. Those are oranges. Sour orange. Sour and also, oh, when you do your pickled pepper. pepper, you pickled onion, usually you use vinegar. We almost don't use vinegar, we use the juice of peanuts. Mm, yeah. And particularly excellent when ladies have given birth and have no milk at the breast. You take a hot shower of the lips and immediately the really? same day, it will have enough <laughs> milk to feed the, ba the baby yeah, for the next six months. Really wow. Excellent. I'm getting Flintstone feet with mud. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> in the middle of nowhere, some of them walking barefoot, and some of them covering with some leather skins. Just imagine how they had to handle to live out there in the jungle. They didn't have just to take, to know how to live along with it, but they learned how to take advantage of it for their benefit. You see, we have a lot of, a lot of resources around here and Mayas lived in the middle of the jungle with animals, white animals, reptiles, insects, all kind of bugs, and snakes, and birds. So it was not easy, but they learned how to do it perfectly. And they learned how to take advantage of it. Four and a half years ago, we had a terrible hurricane that hit Costa Maya and we lost 65% of the pier. And we had to close the port for nearly 18 months to redo the pier. You see the pier was made with concrete, solid concrete with one inch rebar in the middle. We lost 65% of it. We had to clean all the concrete from the bottom of the sea and redo it again. And Mayas lived at thatched roof houses like the one we saw at the service area, mm -hmm. and that thatch roof was damaged about 40%. Mm -hmm. 
How come it resisted more than the concrete? Well, Myers were smart, <laughs> remember. <laughs> How did that happen? Well, it's this palm tree. And it's not compact, so the wind blew through it. Oh. And also, it's thick, so the rain doesn't leak, and the sunshine doesn't go under it. So under it, it's very cool, especially in the hot summer days. <coughs> and the secret of this is that they have to cut it when it's ripening. And that happens between full moon and new moon. If you cut it in the other period, you will be knocking down about half of its lifetime. These palms can resist between 15 to 25 years. And you don't have to replace them all at once by portions. As you see, they're getting old, you replace them. So they resisted much more than the hurricane. I mean, than the concrete made ones. Mayas used to live in these kind of huts. And they had no ceiling fans, no air conditioning, and they didn't need it. Because this is really cool. And they had logs that let that air go through. And they had a door <coughs> at the east and a door at the west, so the wind can blow freely. Today, we insist in making our homes with bricks, with bricks and concrete roof. And in this area, if you don't have an air conditioning, you gotta be crazy to live in one of those houses. Because just imagine, in the daytime, it gets up to 110. Can you sleep with that? What we do? We take an almost a midnight shower, and we go in a hammock, and we swing in the hammock. Sometimes, if you don't have an AC, you have to have your ceiling fan, two or three fans, and leave the door open so the air can blow. Otherwise, you cannot stand it. But Mayas never needed to do that because they knew how to do it. And also, they took advantage of many other things. For example, this tree, it's called Cycropia, the uh, scientific name. We call it Guarumbo. If you suffer diabetes, you just have to take three or four leaves and make a tea. Drink it, that will level your sugar. No more problem with diabetes. But the baby brown ones, the baby ones at the middle, at the center, we call them Jimmy Hendrix. <laughs> Those are highly hallucinogenic. The last time I tried one, I ended up in the hand. I so let's oh get gosh. out of here to avoid temptation. <laughs> yeah, now you know we all want one. We can see a chamber here, another chamber over there on the right, and we can see three chambers we had at the top. Mayas had no cemetery. When someone died, they would bury him or him or her at the backyard. They make a hole, put the body, bury it, and the life keeps, keeps moving. Kids keep playing in the same backyard. And the ruler had to do the same, but they did it at their home. This is their home. So sometimes they did a chamber, and they put a sarcophagus in the chamber, and they sealed it to the hospital or the doctor when I had diarrhea, vomit, dizzy, stomachache, fever, and other symptoms. He treated me himself, and he healed me like this. The secret is this, and this is a Mayan remedy. Only Mayas knew this. Fastening, he used to lay me on the ground, on the floor. It's gonna be sturdy. If you have a massage table, that would work. But as he did it, he used the floor. So he laid me on the floor. He took his thumb and he dipped it at my umbilical cord. And there must be a pulse. What's that pulse? Blood. It's the aorta yeah. coming over here, splits here to irrigate the legs. So when you have those diseases, the aorta moves to the left, never to the right because no space on the right. On the left, it's just the intestine. And you identify where it is, and at the beginning, gently, you start giving massage, using some oil to avoid hurting the skin, and later, as it gets softened, 
you start doing it harder until you send that pulse back to the umbilical. When you press the umbilical and the pulse is there, all those diseases will have gone with no need of medication. And that worked with me many times, and I did it to my kids many times, and it's still working today. But the secret is that we never do it to someone else, just the family. Yeah. Unless it's a very, very close relative or an extremely close friend, or we have a relation, then we would do it. Otherwise, it's just the family, because that's the, the secret we do uh, as mothers. And you don't have insurance. No insurance. <laughs> as a fact, most of Mexicans don't have insurance in Mexico. We don't have insurance. When you are an employee, you have Medicare. They will give you the treatment, surgery if it's necessary, and medicine, and they will pay your salary the days you don't work. But when you are a tour guide like me, I don't have a boss because I'm independent, so we have no Medicare. We have to do it on our own way. <laughs> Is that going to call the female jaguar? Nobody she better knows be ready. what is this. <laughs> 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 Only my and this is the end of our tour in Costa Maya, and we get free beer, local and, beer. And our last stop <laughs> last on time, this cruise. Our last time of waking up early. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers.